Amen, amen, amen. I want to invite your friends to open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Philippians chapter 4. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, we are so incredibly thankful that you are present with us today. Uh, you're present. There is something that happens when we gather together as a church family. No matter what the week has looked like, when we come together, great things happen because the Bible says where two or three are gathering in his name, he is in the very midst. It's a good thing to gather together. We need each other as we seek to live our lives for him. I want to remind you, Philippians chapter 4, I want to read just a couple of verses for us this morning, beginning at verse 6, and it reads this way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We could probably go home from here. That's all we need. I mean, we, we good from here. You may take your seats. Very familiar verse here in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. I want to share just a, a few words from this subject. Have you prayed about it? Ask your neighbor, have you prayed about it? And ask your other neighbor, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? It's a question that is easily overlooked. But I want to suggest to you that it's one of the most important questions that you can ever be asked. This question speaks of the recognition and awareness that in life, we often are quick to act and slow to pray. Quick to worry, but slow to pray. Quick to complain, slow to pray. Quick to act and have an action plan, but slow to pray. But today I want to challenge us that you ought to make it an important part of your daily routine to ask yourself and to ask others, have you prayed about it? You see, prayer in the life of the believer is not an optional thing. In the life of a believer, prayer is not something that you just use periodically or when you think you need it. But the scriptures convey to us that prayer is like oxygen for the very soul of a believer. That prayer is something that you've got to rely on each and every day of your life. Friends, that prayer is the thing that allows you to talk to God, but it also allows God to talk right back to you. That prayer is that very thing that gives you direction and insight. You ought to pray before you make a decision. You ought to pray after you've made the decision. You ought to, prayer has to be at the very core of your life for whatever reason, myself included, friends. I don't know what it is, but sometimes we become too busy to pray. Sometimes it's our own busyness that keeps us from praying. Sometimes it's our own doubts about prayer. Sometimes it's our own inadequacies about prayer. Sometimes it's our own struggles that for whatever the reason may be, if you're like me, sometimes our prayer lives are not where they need to be. And I believe that God wants to challenge us through his scriptures and challenge us through his word that friends, you and I can not make it without prayer. Friends, along with your iPhone and your iPad, you better find you and I pray. And friends, you and I must learn how to make prayer part of how we live our lives. Whatever it is, sometimes, this is what Paul is calling this church at Philippi to remember. He is calling them in this last chapter to remind them of the centrality of prayer to their lives. He's reminding them that you're going to need a healthy prayer life if you're going to live a healthy Christian life. 
You're going to be able to deal with all the stuff that comes your way. Deal with all the things that happen in your life. You and I need a healthy, strong, vibrant prayer life. Paul is not writing this letter from, from, a, from a palace or from the Ritz Carlton. No, he's writing this letter from a prison cell because Paul understands the centrality of prayer in our lives. Friends, I want to encourage you as you read, if we read today's text, that it be a reminder to you and to each of us about how we need to make prayer a priority in our lives. I don't care when you do it. I don't care if you do it every morning when you wake up. I don't care whether you gather your family in prayer before you leave today. Doesn't matter if you do it at night before everyone goes to bed. Doesn't matter if you got a prayer group on your job and you guys gather once a week and you pray for your department and you pray for each other. Doesn't matter if you got a prayer friend and y'all text each other every day before a certain time. Doesn't matter if you got a prayer guide where Monday you pray for this, Tuesday you pray for this, Wednesday, I don't care how you do it, but friends, here's the challenge. We must make prayer a priority. This is what he's trying to encourage us to do. But it's easy for us to scroll through the feeds on Instagram, scroll through the feeds on, on Facebook, scroll through the feed of our favorite app or whatever we do. But he says, I want you to learn how to spend time with me. Here's what prayer does. First of all, prayer removes our worry. Prayer removes our worry. Here's what he says in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. He says, I don't want you anxious. I don't want you worried about anything. I don't want worry to be the way your life is described. This is not the first time he tells them not to worry. Matter of fact, he'll bring it up in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. He'll bring it up again in 1 Peter 5 and 7. He says, listen, I don't need you worried about anything. That worry is not a part of the life of a believer. That because you are a follower of Christ, worry should not define you. Here's what you know about worry will wear you out. It'll make you bite your nails. It'll make you toss and turn in your sleep. It'll make you constantly anxious and nervous. It'll make you angry with everybody. It'll make you irritable. It'll, it'll make your hair fall out. It'll make you eat too much and not eat enough. Worry will make you cause panic attacks. Worry will, will make you anxious about everything. Don't get me wrong, life seems like it's sometimes full of stuff to be worried about. It seems like we can be worried about our kids, we can be worried about our lives, we can learn about our finances, worried about our mothers or our fathers. We can be worried about our brothers or our sisters. We can be worried about our, our jobs and our careers. We can be worried about our children or our grandchildren. We can be worried about our health or the health of someone that we love. We can be worried about what could happen, what not's going to happen, what will happen when this gets found out. There seems to be, life seems to be full of things to worry about. What I want you to understand, this scripture says, I don't want you to be anxious about anything. What God is saying to you and me that as followers of Christ, we don't have to worry about anything. As a matter of fact, when worry shows up, we shouldn't entertain it, we should evict it. Because we know that worry does not belong in the mind of a believer because worry is us putting more faith in our doubts than we put faith in the God in which we serve. If the God that we serve woke us up this morning, gives us strength and stamina, gives us minds in the right capacity, gives us health and strength, if God can take care of us, if God can take care of blades of grass and sparrows in the air, then cannot God take care of you and take care of me and take care of the stuff that consumes us sometimes. 
See, the reason the enemy wants you to worry, because he knows if he gets you worrying, he'll get you off track on what God can do. He'll make you forget God's word. He'll make you forget the track record of God's faithfulness in his life. And you'll be so worried about the situation that you'll think that you got to get yourself out of the situation. And you'll forget you've got a God in heaven that looks down on you and sees you and says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you I will walk with you I will be with you I will protect you I will heal you I will shepherd you you are not in this by yourself somebody can go home now you are not in this by yourself you have a God that's with you Prince we get over concern where we try to do too much and those worries begin to invade our minds we begin to say, what if this happens? And what if this doesn't happen? And what if they find out this? And, and what if my business doesn't go well? And what if I fail? And what if I'm humiliated? And we get concerned about all the what ifs. But the good news is this, friend, all that you can handle is the present. You don't know the future. You can't handle the past. But the Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The good thing about being a child of God is the stuff that I can't handle. I've got a God that can handle me and handle the stuff at the same time it'd be different if you had to do it all on your own no you got a God who cares for you that's why the scriptures say cast your cares on him because he cares for you friend you better watch out for worry because worry wants to invade your heart worry wants to invade your mind worry wants to invade your circumstances and whenever you see it show up in your mind and in your heart, you got to remind yourself that I don't have to worry. Because the scripture conveys to me that I, I, I don't have to worry. I don't have to give in to the anxiety and the anxiousness that wants to keep me up, that wants to make me restless, that wants to consume me, that wants to make me think the negative and wants to make me think that this, that the worst is going to happen in my life. William Ward says this about worry. He says, worry distorts our thinking, disrupts our work, disquiets our soul, disturbs our body, disfigures our face, destroys our friends, demoralizes our life, destroys, defeats our faith, debilitates our energy, and unfits us to meet our difficulties. William Ward says, worry is faith in the negative. That word anxiety means to care, but it means to overcare. A young girl received a beautiful flowering plant for her 12th birthday. She was so excited, she, she had never taken care of a plant all of her own, so she was determined to keep this plant alive and beautiful. And she knew that living in Florida, that people often watered their lawns like once a week. And so she decided that she would do the same thing for her plant. She watered it every single day. After two weeks, she noticed that a couple of leaves started turning yellow. So she decided that, she would, that what she was watering it wasn't enough. So she began to water it twice a day and began to add fertilizer to it. Within a week, all the leaves fell off. It turned yellow. The next week, all the leaves are gone. She killed the plant because she overcared for it. Some of us are guilty of overcaring for some stuff. It's okay to care, but some of us overcare for our children, overcare for a relationship, overcare about our finances, overcare about our family, overcare for our health issues. And friends, you got to know that you and I have a limited capacity. That there's a point where you got to realize what you can do ends and what God can do shows up. And sometimes you got to learn how to say, I care, but I'm not going to take on too much responsibility because I can't fix nobody. I can't can't change nobody, I can't decide for nobody, I can't live nobody's life, but I've got a God that can work where I cannot work. I still care and I still love you, but I am not going to take on so much on my life that I know I can't.
cannot handle. That's God's territory. God, can you give me the grace to be able to trust you when I know I can't do nothing about it? God, can you give me the grace to be able to trust your work and your presence and your power when I am limited in my power and capacity? Lord, give us, give us the grace not to over care. This is, this is Paul. See, worry makes you doubt what God can do. Worry makes you doubt that God, that, that, that what you're facing now is bigger than the God that you serve. It may be new to you, but it's not new to the God that you serve. It, it, matter of fact, if you would just take time and begin to think back over your life, you would realize that this is not a, this may have a new face, but it's the same thing you faced two years ago. And the same God that was faithful in that is the same God that will be faithful today. <laughs> prayer, prayer removes our worry. But then secondly, prayer refocuses us on God. Yeah. It refocuses us on God. Look at the next part of the verse. Don't be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Paul says, listen, I don't want you to worry about anything. And you're saying, well, wait a minute. If I'm not going to worry, what am I supposed to do? If you're telling me not to worry, you don't know what I'm facing. You don't know the news I got. You don't know what I've been dealing with. And Paul says, here's what you ought to do. Instead of worrying, I want you to pray. And it says, though Paul knows that many of us are kind of slow, so, so Paul says, listen, I'm not going to tell you one time. I'm going to tell you three times. And he uses three different words for prayer as though so we won't miss it. He says, pray, which means to ask of God. Then he says, petition, which means also to ask of God. Then he says, present your request, which means to ask specifically of God. He uses three Greek words for the same word. They all mean the same thing, basically, pray. It's almost as though he doesn't want us to miss this. That the way you deal with worry is that when worry comes in your life, it means you got to raise your prayer life. It means that, that when you become consumed, when you become overwhelmed, when life starts throwing stuff at you, when you feel like, I don't know about this, he says your, 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 your answer and the way that you resolve it is to learn how to pray to God and depend on God and look to God. And see, so here's the challenge. Many of us, uh, we, 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 we specialize in emergency prayers. We, 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 we treat prayer like it's a spare key. You know, when we can't get the door open ourselves, we whip out prayer and say, I'm going to pray the door open. We, we treat spray, prayer like a spare tire. And so when we have a flat in life, now, now we want to whip out prayer and use prayer to be able to get us out of a jam. But notice the text. The text says, worry about nothing pray about everything which means you serve a God that's interested in the very details of your life that this God that we serve is not just wants to be talked to when there's big stuff in your life no he's concerned about every detail of your life he's concerned about what school you're choosing for your kids he, he's concerned about your health and your strength he's concerned about your dating life and your financial life and your health life and your physical life and your mental life he's concerned about the decisions you're making at work and the decisions you're making at home and the decisions you're making in your family. He's concerned about what the doctor said, what your boss said, what your friend said, what your sister said. You serve a God that wants to be involved in every detail of your life. And friend, don't just talk to him when there's a case of emergency. Friend, talk to him every day. When you're on your way to work tomorrow, you need to be praying, Lord, guide me as I go to work today. Lord, order my steps, order my path, order my conversations. Keep my mind, keep my temper. Lord, give me success in the place you've planted me. Pray over your kids. God, be with my kids as they go to school. Keep them safe. Keep them focused. Give them integrity. Give them good character. God, guide me in my singleness. Lord, protect me and honor me. Help me to fulfill the purpose you've got in my life for now. And if you have something later, do that too. Friends, pray. Prayer keeps you from worrying. He says it three times. He says, listen, I want you to pray. 
I want you to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to make prayer part of your daily habits, part of your daily walk. Sometimes the enemy, what he does is he tries to convince you that you're not a good prayer. You know, I don't feel like I know how to say it, and I don't, I don't feel adequate enough. Listen, prayer is real simple. It's just you talking to God. It's you, it's you saying, God, this is who I am, and God, this is what I'm facing, and God, this is what I'm dealing with. And this is, it's you talking to God about God. It's about you saying, God, I praise you for, for you being great and for you being strong and for you being holy. It's, it's you honoring God. Anybody can talk to God when you're a follower of Christ. You, anybody can trust him, but God wants to be involved in every part of your life. But notice what he says. He said, I want you to pray about that. He says, when that thing tries to get the best of you, I want you to pray about that. When you can't get to sleep at night, he said, perhaps until the scroll, and I want you to pray about that. He says, when that thing or that relationship, I want you to pray. And what you love about Scripture is that Scripture gives you a totality of the stuff you ought to pray for. He says, you ought to pray for your friends and pray for your enemies. He says, you ought to pray when you're healthy and strong. And you ought to pray when you're sick or when someone in your family is sick. He says you ought to pray when you're full of joy and when things are going well. But you also ought to pray when you feel like God is absent in your life. Or when you feel like God is distant. When you read the Psalms, which is basically a prayer book or a hymn book to God, you find all kinds of prayers. You find prayers when they miss the mark and sinned against God. And they were struggling to try to figure out, how do I overcome the fallenness that I face? And you find other prayers when they were going into worship and they were going in and honoring God. Friends, I want, he says, I want you to start making it a habit to pray for those things that try to bog down your heart and mind. But look what the text says. With thanksgiving. It's almost as though he says, listen, in the midst of all your asking, please don't forget to thank God for what God has already done in your life, for how he's already worked in your life. He said, I want you to mix these two together. He said, don't just come, just ask, 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 ask. He says, in the midst of your asking, make sure you learn how to thank God because sometimes in the midst of your thanking, it helps you to deal with the thing you were worried about because sometimes while you were worried about it, when you start thanking God for what God has already done, it registers and you begin to leave, begin to believe, why am I worrying about that? When I thank God for what God has already done, how God has already worked and what God God has already seen me through. Friends, that may be a habit for some of you today. When you get home today, you might want to pull out your phone and just begin to make a list of the things that you can thank God for. You ought to just begin to thank God for the things he's seen you through, from the doors he's opened, for the ways he's made. You ought to just look over your life and begin to thank God. And I promise you, as you begin to thank God for what he's already done, you're going to get to a point where you begin to say in the midst of your prayer, God, if you don't do anything else, I've looked at the list. And if you don't do anything else based on this list, you've already done enough. I'm going to stop worrying. You know what? Now that I think about it, God, I was here five years ago. I was here two years ago. I've seen trouble before, but I've seen you come through before. And so, God, I'm stop worrying, and I'm just going to praise you in advance. If you do it, I'm going to praise you. If you don't, I'm going to still praise you. If I keep the job, I'm going to praise you. If I lose the job, I'm going to still praise you. If you heal my body, I'm going to praise you. And if you don't, I'm going to still praise you you because God you've been so good to me already that even if it doesn't work out I'll still give you praise Paul, Paul is saying to you that when you talk to God don't just fill up your list with all the stuff you want from God and all the stuff you need from God but in the midst of you talking to God Spend some time thanking God for the work and the move and the things he's done in your life. Dan, Danny Simpson was a 23-year-old Can Canadian. Danny Simpson went to jail for robbing a bank. And Danny, Danny went to jail. He, he was arrested for robbing a bank for $6,000. They sent him to jail for six years. 
But in the midst of his robbery, he used a 45 caliber Colt semi-automatic gun that was actually an antique. The gun was from 1918. Matter of fact, the pistol in his hand was worth $100,000. If, if Danny Simpson had just known what he was carrying in his hand, he wouldn't have robbed the bank because he would have known he had everything he needed already in his hand. Who am I talking to today? Friend, you're looking at everything that you think you need. But sometimes you got to look in your hand and just begin to thank the Lord for what the God has already put in your hand, for what God has already done. He's already blessed you. He's already kept you. He's already opened doors. He's already seen you through difficult times. He's already healed your body. And you just got to learn how to tell the Lord, thank you for what you have already done. This ought to be your declaration before God that you ought to learn how to, how to walk with this attitude of gratitude, with this disposition where you can't help yourself but to tell God, thank you. You ought to wake up in the morning saying, Lord, I thank you. When you begin to walk in the house, you ought to be able to say, Lord, I thank you. When you can hear what's happening in the house, you ought to begin to say, Lord, I thank you. When your words start coming out, you ought to be able to say, Lord, I thank you. When you get in your car, you ought to be able to say, Lord, I thank you. When you arrive at your job, you ought to be able to say, Lord, I thank you. When you get a paycheck on the 1st and the 15th, you ought to be able to say, Lord, I thank you. When you've got a roof over your head, you ought to be able to declare, Lord, I thank you. When you look at your resume and what God has done in your life, when you look at your LinkedIn and see your profile and what God has done, you ought to be able to declare, Lord, I thank you. When you think about when you were sick but now you're well, you ought to say, Lord, I thank you. You ought to think about when you were depressed and broke down, even suicidal, but God gave you your joy back. God gave you your mind back. God gave you your hope back. And all you can do is say, Lord, I thank you. When you think about your enemies that tried to take you out, tried to make you lose your focus, lose your job, lose your mind, and yet here you are today. And all you can do is say the Lord will be my shepherd. He'll walk with you and talk with you. He'll prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. And all you can do is say look at what the Lord has done. Hallelujah somebody. Somebody ought to tell him thank you. Somebody, somebody ought to just tell him thank you. You've come too far. And don't you dare think you got this far on your own. The grace of God has been on your life. The grace of God has kept you in your life. And you just ought to tell the Lord thank you. Your neighbor don't know what you've been through. Your friend doesn't know what you've been through. But you know what the Lord has been doing in you and through you. Helped you raise those kids. Helped you get started on your way. Gave you back your self-esteem when they broke up and tried to leave you. Gave you back your focus when your father wasn't there. God has been good to you. And sometimes you just got to tell him, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for keeping us. Thank you, God, for walking with us. Thank you, God, for giving us confidence and boldness when we wanted to give up, when stuff got hard, when we didn't know what to do, when we wanted to give up. God has been faithful, and sometimes you got to tell the Lord thank you. 
And I don't know about you, but I can think of my own story. I, I shouldn't be standing in this pulpit. It's by the grace of God that I am here today. When they called me to the church, I wasn't qualified, didn't have the seminary training. They had to rewrite the qualifications so the qualifications would fit me. I just came by to tell somebody, I know what God can do. I know what it's like to be overwhelmed in life. Pastoring this church to get overwhelming sometimes. Hearing people's prayers and hearing what people are going through. And trying to lead the way God wants you to lead. That thing can get overwhelming sometimes. Anybody that's in leadership knows you can get overwhelmed. Leading your family, leading your department, leading in your situations. Anybody, if you lead in anything, you, you know that leadership can overwhelm you sometimes. But I love this text. He says, because you got to learn how to thank God for the journey that you've been on. And when you don't know the answers, and you don't know what, and you don't know when, and you don't know how, and when stuff happens in your life that you didn't plan on, you didn't anticipate, you didn't see coming, you didn't know how, he says, I want you in the midst of all your asking for me to do something. In the midst of that, just stop, start thanking me for what I've already done in your life. And then he says, and the peace, of God <laughs> and the peace of God that passes all understanding <laughs> and the peace of God that passes all understanding. Don't you read the Bible too fast because he doesn't say that he'll pray and you thank him and he's going to answer your prayer immediately. The text doesn't say mama was healed. The text doesn't say your marriage got better. The text doesn't say that you stopped going to the doctor. The text doesn't say that you stopped chemotherapy and radiation. The text doesn't say that you were able to get your job back. But the text says, and the peace of God. In other words, in the midst of what you were worrying about, you gave God your worry and God gave you his peace. Hallelujah, somebody today. Ooh. 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 You give him your worries. You give him your anxiety. You you give him your cares. You, you give him what you don't understand. You give him your plans that you can't fix. You give him that, and he will begin to give you back his peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. He'll make you leap when you shouldn't be leaping. He'll make you smile when you shouldn't be smiling. He'll make you happy when you shouldn't be happy. He'll make you run when you shouldn't be running. He'll make you dance when you shouldn't be dancing. He'll make you shout when you shouldn't be shouting. And all you can declare is that the peace of God has surrounded your life. Somebody here this morning can testify. I 
I prayed and I gave it to God and God showed up in my life and he gave me his peace. Hallelujah, somebody today, he'll give you peace that the world didn't give you and the world can't take away. He'll give you peace while your enemies are still talking. He'll give you peace with no money in the bank. He'll give you peace when you don't know what lies ahead. You ought to thank God for his peace. Hallelujah. He says, this peace is going to guard your heart, it's going to guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Softly. He's going to give you a peace in your heart. He's going to give you a peace in your mind. Let's go guard you. Let's go guard your heart so your heart ain't got to be anxious. Your heart ain't got to be worried. Your heart ain't got to be consumed. Your heart ain't got to have answers. Your heart ain't got to have no itinerary. I know you want to be in control. I know you like to plan everything out. But sometimes you can't plan everything out. Sometimes you don't have an itinerary. Sometimes you don't have a schedule. Sometimes it's not in your Outlook calendar. Sometimes you ain't got an app to fix this. But what you do have is some peace. And this peace is go guard your heart. It's going to guard your emotions so you don't have to lose yourself. You know what's happening at home, but you go walk in your job and still be productive. Why? Because the peace is with you. So guard your mind so you're not anxious and your mind is not worried, your mind is not consumed, your mind is not all over the place. You, you can't even know, you can't even think straight. But when you give this to God, He's going to give you a peace on your mind that your mind is going to be able to think clearly. You're going to be able to recall the promises of God that you need for this season in your life. And so when the enemy tries to make you worry, you're going to be able to recall, cast your cares on him. When the enemy wants the thoughts of doubt in your mind, you're going to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want when the enemy tries to remind you of what could happen, you're going to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, for the saving of many lives. When he tries to make you doubt what God can do, you're going to declare to yourself, and we know that all things work to the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. When you're in the midst of waiting and you can't be patient, you're going to say, and they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Peace. Lord, peace. Give those worries to God today and begin to walk in the power and presence that he calls you to. You don't have to be like everybody else, walking around fretting and worried and anxious. No, you've got a God that cares for you. You've got a God that knows your name. You've got a God that knows when you get up and when you lay down. You've got a God that knows the number of hairs on your head. You've got a God that says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You've got a God that knew you while you were still in your mother's womb. You've got a God that has a plan for your life. You've got a God that is looking over you and watching over you and sends angels to encamp all about you. You've got a God that when you fall, he'll lift you back up. You've got a God that when you sin, he'll forgive you. You can have peace because you've got a God that's for you. You've got a God that's with you. You've got a God that cares for you. 